This podcast is intended for informational purposes only and should not be interpreted to be direct medical or psychological advice for you or a specific individual. Always consult your personal physicians and clinicians for your individual medical and psychiatric care. The views, opinions, and information presented from any of our guests do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of the host of this podcast. We hope you enjoy this show. Hello, I'm Dr. Jeffrey DeSarbo, psychiatrist specializing in eating disorders at ED180. And I'm Lucas DeSarbo. I'm an LMSW specializing in the treatment of eating disorders, also at ED180. And welcome to Translating Ed, which is essentially we're trying to give you some updates on some of the most recent scientific research on eating disorders that's published in the medical and psychological journals uh, nationally and internationally. And to remind you, Translating Ed is really about trying to take some of these very complex articles, and we'll give you some examples today, and give you the meaning of those articles, uh, what the research shows, and when possible, how can you use that in your treatment if you're a patient or your family? How does this help you under, better understand what's going on with yourself? And if you're a clinician, how can you take this information and kind of use that in your private practice? So we're hoping we can take this uh, complex stuff and make it user-friendly uh, and let you know how it applies in real life. And we'll get started right away on some of these studies. Um, I'll get study, Lucas. Uh, so there's some interesting studies that came out. Um, one of the things that I often speak about is the changes that take place uh, neurobiologically and changes with the brain. And in some of the neuro series episodes that I've had on my YouTube ch channel, Dr. Jeffrey DeSarbo, um, we've covered different types of structural changes uh, with regards to brain matter with both gray matter loss in the brain and white matter loss. And that white matter is really something that provides a lot of the substantial structure and functioning of the brain. So one of the studies I have here is uh, brain white matter microstructure in obese women with binge eating disorder. Um, because oftentimes in some of my studies, I tend to stay focused on brain changes with anorexia nervosa and binge eating disorder. And this study was really came out and it shows that even with binge eating disorder, um, women have uh, significant white matter alterations. Uh, they did some um, studies using uh, functional MRI and it showed that uh, compared to healthy controls, there's changes that take place in both the frontal parts of the brain and the limbic system, which is, is, is your emotional brain. It's on the inside of the brain. There's a connection back and forth. And there's parts of, if you've watched our neuro series at all, of the parietal lobe, which is often involved with things like body interpretation, body image function, drives for thinness, and that these pathways are important also in the decision-making process. And with binge eating disorder, studies have shown that we get these um, alterations with that white matter, the, all these cells that kind of support the central neurons of the brain and its functioning. And it's something that I kind of pulled out as something to mention today because, again, I've kind of not uh, maybe brought enough attention that there are changes, and a lot of them are significant when we're talking about eating disorders like anorexia nervosa, but it takes place with binge eating as well. So uh, these little microstructural differences can play a, a huge role in how a person thinks, functions, makes decisions. Um, I'll move on to the next study. Uh, the next study kind of brings uh, up some information on it's called a portal hypotension and prolonged anorexia nervosa with laxative abuse. And this is a case report with liver and kidney biopsy data. And there's been a few case studies out there and it shows, again, some of the risks that are involved with uh, eating disorders. And in this case, and it's a, uh, a case that was presented from a patient in Japan, a 34-year-old woman with anorexia nervosa binge purge type. Uh, and they conducted some hepatic, which uh, like liver biopsies, kidney biopsies. They did cardiac magnetic resonance imaging studies. 
to evaluate her complicated liver disease, and there was some re renal failure and cardiac insufficiency. And they found uh, that uh, there was many types of important medical conditions, ascites, uh, large spleen, gastrointestinal uh, varices, indicating a portal hypotension. Now, portal hypotension really is uh, pressure in the portal vein. It's, it's, it's a vein which re carries the blood from all your other digestive organs to the liver. And you can get this high increased pressure, which can cause significant problems down the road. Um, and it then can affect other organ systems as well. In this study, they found there was problems in the kidneys. There was myocardial mass. The heart itself was actually reduced. Um, and they were proposing that the interactions between all of these factors related to anorexia and the um, self-induced vomiting and laxative abuse significantly contributes to the um, toxicity, the dehydration, the renal disorders, uh, cardiac insufficiency because of the uh, loss of heart muscle. And, and, and these are the factors that re lead to that increase in portal hyper hypertension, which uh, poses substantial complications and threat to health uh, through the liver. Um, hopefully we won't see too many of those patients or anything, but you know, it's always important that you know, you're, you're consulting with the medical doctors and everything mm -hmm. to follow up and, and look for any lab ab abnormalities. I think sometimes what's interesting, Lucas, is when you're working with patients and doctors and, you know, you know as a physician, even I uh, sometimes, you know, I want certain information or I may want to perform some education to physicians <laughs> and uh, I I've learned, I've worked around them. I actually became a doctor because I felt it was hard to talk to doctors. Um, um, and physicians sometimes, you know, they have their ways of thinking it's set. Um, but how, well, I'm just wondering, like, if you have any medical concerns, what's been your experiences speaking with physicians? Um, you know, collaborative care is of increased importance, especially now. Um, whether it's with a dietitian or with a physician. Um, I mean, really, from my experience so far, is you want to make sure that the client is on board with this kind of consulting and that they're willing to go back and forth and make sure they're checking things from all sides because unless they have this explained to them directly or unless they're asking the right questions, it's really kind of hard to detect if you're going to have any of these issues come up. Right. Um, because, you know, it's when you say dehydration... You know, it's, it's the ripple effects from that that could contribute to something, you know, like the comorbidities of an eating disorder. How is that affecting their depressive symptoms? How is that affecting their anxiety? Right. So being able to have an eye on that from all sides is important. Um, as far as collaborating with the physicians, um, my experience is usually brief. Uh, unfortunately, I am not in the position... You are where I do not serve to provide any education towards those physicians. Um, so, so far I take what they can give me and I try and run with it and bring that to my client in a way right. that they can understand it. It, it, it is interesting because you say you're not in a position to provide that education. Although many times I'm talking and I'm saying in a very gentle, subtle way, we do have to like, 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 clinicians, uh, therapists, nutritionists, other people, oftentimes we're aware of what the patient is going through physically, medically, because they'll often talk to us longer and they'll, and, right. and they'll report these things. So sometimes we do want to gently let the physician know that the, what the client is reporting. And sometimes, you know, even with co communication, you know, trying to get a physician on a telephone call is almost impossible at times. Uh, you know, uh, you've used email communications before, like group collaborative. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's the way to go, actually, when when working with an eating disorder team is it can be hard to to make several calls during the day. So a lot of times a uh, kind of a group text on certain patients, especially complications, need to be set up. And I find that often works well in, in educate. Everyone can educate everyone on what their specialty is kind of contributing to the treatment of a patient. So, And as far as the, um, the psychotherapy side of it, what is their input into that collaboration, do you feel? Well, 
it's always important that the patients feel that that collaborative approach is taking place. Now, the only difference is, you know, that's one of the things that's different treating an eating disorder patient than a therapist or psychiatrist who's, let's say, treating a basic anxiety, depression, bipolar, is that eating disorders are so collaborative. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk with Robin because Robin does a great job in her book explaining the importance of uh, of the collaboration that's required and uh, how she actually interacts with the physician. And, and, and she's amazing at what she knows medically, you know. And I'm sure she knows more than most even physicians when it comes to certain interpretation of lab values and everything in this patient population. And, uh, you know, but it's, it's you, you, you have to learn to, you know, tread lightly, I, I, you know, as a physician, you know, it's like, you know, it's like I apologize for all my colleagues and myself. So at times, all right, let me just uh, cover another study here. Um, this, there, there's a study that was done, and I'm going to just cover this briefly. It was, it's titled Elevated Neurobehavioral Responses to Negative Social Interactions in Women with Bulimia Nervosa. A study came out in February 2021 in, in uh, um, Biological Psychiatry, Cognitive Neuroscience, Neuroimaging. So they really did use something uh, to take a different approach. They wanted to look at some uh, magnetic resonance imaging data, and they used this thing called uh, computational psychiatry. Um, you heard Which of that? Can, you, yeah, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, computational psychiatry is a, a very interesting approach. It's a little more complex. It combines multiple levels and types of data that are kind of incorporated to improve the understanding in an effort to kind of have a prediction uh, 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 of treatment and, and, and develop better treatment plans as far as uh, not just with eating disorders, but with uh, mental illness in general. And in this study, they had uh, 24 women with bulimia, 26 healthy comparisons. And what they were looking at is what happens when with social interactions when someone has a negative uh, kind of like experience in, in, in a certain context. And what that, of course, resulted in is more negative behavioral responses and a stronger neural activation in many parts of the brain, both cortical regions of the brain, which is kind of like the outside parts of your brain, and subcortical regions, which are the deeper regions of the brain and the, and, and, and the limbic system and everything, which is your emotional brain. So what they found basically is um, there were significant differences when there was this negative result in a social interaction that took place in, in women with uh, bulimia nervosa, certain activations that you didn't see in the healthy controls. And meanwhile, if, if someone has a positive interaction, there was no difference with patients with bulimia nervosa compared to those who uh, are, the, are the healthier controls. And this kind of suggests a very specific form of, uh, of, of a psychopathology with bulimia nervosa, that you get this amplification of negative self-relevant uh, references with negative social interactions. Um, I, I think, you know, there's several regions of the brain they bring about, and some people are familiar because of, like, the neuro series, again, that's, that's available on YouTube, where we talk about brain regions like the amygdala, the fear centers, and everything that were associated with this type of pathology. Um, but I think the relevance of this, really, is that future treatments for bulimia may include targeting certain neural regions that support these negative biases mm. in social you know, perceptions. So. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the one thing, you know, Lucas is always here because, you know, I'm on the psychiatric neuroscience, neurobiology. Um, but as we work together as a therapist, and I think most therapists, you have to start to understand the neurobiological implications uh, of mental disorders, and especially if you're specializing in eating disorders, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, until you understand the pathology, I mean, that this sounds like a cognitive distortion discounting the positives. Right. You know? That's what it would appear as to a psychotherapist, and if you're explaining to your client, that is uh, a palatable way for them to take that information as, like, is this, is this something you find yourself doing? And then it's a matter of untwisting the thought. Right. Um, 
but knowing that there are uh, that it's it's a neurobehavioral response makes it more concrete for them, right? Uh, depending on the way you present that information to them, but it, you know when you provide a more tangible uh, perspective on the possibility of change, uh, I always find that it's a lot more easy to comprehend. Not that it's just oh well, this is the way you think, this is the way you should think, you know. And again, I think that's the whole point of our podcast. It's trying to take some of this information and translate it and make it usable for patients. Right. You know, uh, if you give patients uh, an education and a knowledge of what's taking place, it becomes a lot easier to work with them, uh, e- even from a therapeutic point of view, you know, doing the therapy and everything. Um, people like to know if I'm doing a certain thing, why do I do that? We get that question all the time. Uh, I'm just going to, I, w- I want to jump ahead, Luke. I know yeah. we ki- we both came across this article, which is kind of like ahead of its time a little bit. Uh, it it's, uh, came out in April, uh, again, of this year. So it's a brand new article. Uh, you want to tell us about it? What's it called? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the fir- at first glance, um, well, the, the article is virtual reality app used for treating uh eating disorders. And to me, I thought that, wow, this is way ahead of its time. (laughs) And looking into it a little further, I found that it went back as far as 2013. But this study uh, just wanted to evaluate the feasibility of using this in an eating disorder setting, Um, kind of creating a real life scenario through virtual reality, which is where, you, you know, you put a virtual reality headset on, it projects images that, you know, you perceive in 3D, 180, 360, whatever it would be. Um... And really, it's meant to be a form of safer exposure therapy, I right. want to say. You know, you're not taking the actual risks of being in that situation, but still exposing yourself to the fear. As far as this study goes, um, uh, a lot of the clients uh, had some what sounds like technical difficulties with the app. They found it hard to use. Um, the uh, app, they said, was unusable. Um, and it would need further alteration to really get a good sense of how this would play out. For me, personally, I always get excited when I hear, uh, you know, more technology being incorporated into treating, you know, this right. complex uh, disorder. Well, it did remind me of something when, when Lucas has been working with eating disorders for quite a while again, he, especially when he was involved in our uh, outpatient programs using the biofeedback. And the biofeedback came with certain programs to help, you know, train the mind, mindfulness, calm the body. We were able to measure certain reactions they were having to stimuli and teaching them how to calm it down. And we had discussed at that time, can't we modify this and develop this using food stimuli? So so we could fo- follow things like heart rate variability and things like that and then try to teach patients how to stay calm and everything, which would then be applicable to meal times and right. things like that. Um, Luke, one of the things I noticed here was the mean participant age was 37.9 years old. And I'm just thinking like, you know, it seems to be in the middle of our generations. Uh, but uh, like, we're also talking virtual reality, right. which is, we're still not there, I'm sure. So, so. so, yeah, maybe that had a little bit to do with right. the how usable the user found the app. Right. Um, but, you know, uh, upon further exploration into this type of exposure therapy, uh, which has been used before, it's uh, V-R-E-T. I don't know if it's V-R-E-T or if it's just V-R-E-T, but... Uh, since about 2013, it's been used for exposure therapy. Right. Um, some right. is in a, a lot, mostly to treat phobias. I've found uh, acrophobia, fear of heights, arachnophobia, fear of spiders, um, even uh, some uh, post-traumatic stress disorder cases. And they have seen some data that points to this being a successful means of therapy in the future. Um, Right. I mean, I, it's definitely like, you know, even the article itself, it's saying, you know, this is, this was kind of looking at how well is it accepted, uh, you know, as opposed to measuring an effectiveness for treatment. So I think, you know, it's ahead of its time, but maybe offers some promising things down the road. So I want to take a pause right here uh, so we can bring in our guest, Robin Goldberg, uh, who, again, author of The Eating Disorder Trap. Uh, hopefully some of these studies you were able to understand and gives you some 
you know, pardon the expression, but food for thought. Uh, and we'll be right back with Robin Goldberg. Uh, hi, and welcome back. And we're here with Robin Goldberg, is a registered dietitian nutritionist, a certified eating disorder registered dietitian, and a supervisor for IADEP, which means uh, she's well credentialed to help teach others in the field all the details and nuances of eating disorders. Uh, Robin began her career at Cedars Sinai Medical Center uh, as the inpatient dietitian in the development in the Department of Cardiology. Over the last 24 years, she developed her own private practice in Beverly Hills, California, where she specializes in medical conditions, disordered eating, eating disorders, uh, health at every size, and people in recovery. Uh, Robin, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here. So that was your very brief introduction. Uh, I'm wondering if... Uh, you can tell us a little bit more about yourself as a certified eating disorder right, uh, registered dietitian and supervisor. Sure. So I see kids in my practice and tweens and teens and adults, all that struggle with body image issues and eating disorders. And many of them have medical conditions too, that they had prior to having a, a troubled relationship with food. And I, so love you know seeing everyone i i think um there's so much more work involved when they're younger clients because it becomes a family systems approach and i also you know mentor new dietitians starting out in the field new mental health clinicians and with the eating disorder field growing at a, at a rate that's oftentimes difficult to keep up with, I think, especially over the last year with the pandemic, I really like to do my due diligence and be of service to help not just clients, but clinicians, because as, as you know, right. Jeff, I mean, the clients now oftentimes become so acute and chronic, and we need teams to be able to help whomever it is that we're working with. It's right. not a one-stop shop. I, I always say I'm, I'm like an octopus with tentacles constantly growing out of me to be able to have those resources to be able to help not just the client, but their family and their support system. Yeah. And, and you've doing, been doing this now for quite a while. And, you know, I'm not sure people know, but I know you've also, uh, for the last eight years, Robin's been a, a nutrition counselor for the Susan, is it Cravoy eating disorders program at the yes. Wright Institute yes. in Los Angeles, yes. uh, does a lot of, um, work with eating disorders, body image groups, and that I know you've been really out there too, trying to get the message. You've been a contributing author uh, and, and has been quoted in the New York Times, the Huffington Post, you've been on television. So you've really not just been a practicing clinician, but really putting putting yourself there as an, adv as an advocate in the eating disorder field, which we all greatly appreciate. And now with your new book, The Eating Disorder Trap, A Guide for Clinicians and Loved Ones, you know, I, I, it seems like you've taken the next step. And, you know, I, I, I've, I've read your book in full and I've loved it. And Luke has read it and has found it very helpful too. Um, Thank you. All you right, know. the whole family. So, <laughs> yeah, family. we're kind of a family. Like, it's we're, <laughs> we're first and second generation in our family with eating disorders. But um, we, uh, you know, I, I, I do want to ask you, like, because uh, I, I get asked this question all the time. I know Luke has been getting it. it we all seem to get asked this question when we're, in, when we're in the field of eating disorders, which is how did you get into eating disorders? What led you down that path? Well, I was a college tennis player. And when I was my first year, I played at Sonoma State in the Bay Area. And I didn't know anything about eating disorders growing up. I was so focused on my tennis. And I had three roommates in college, all with bulimia nervosa. And I would fall asleep at night to them purging. That was my exposure to eating disorders. Right. And I was on a different schedule than, you know, all the people I lived with because I had away matches and just a very like structured schedule. And I remember one of them coming up to me in the dining hall when I was living in the dorms 
and was like, I want to tell you about my secret. And I just sat there definitely very green and experienced. And she knew, you know, what she would be sharing with me would stay there. And I learned about what she does and the reasons that she does it. Right. And and then other roommates started to confide in me too. And I didn't think anything of it then. There's a problem. And then when I started working at Cedar Sinai Medical Center after my dietetic internship in Virginia, I remember that the chief clinical dietitian asked who wants to see someone who was admitted with an eating disorder and they were in what was called uh, Thalians, the mental health ward. And really, I always viewed, you know, major medical institution like Cedars is with any health issue, a place to get well, not right. to work on counseling. So I always say I learned eating disorders backwards. Right. I went to see this person who was tied down with restraints, who they were starting a feeding tube. And I think I, I think it's not only archaic, but I mean, this is, you know, over two decades ago, this is like 27 years ago. And I knew at that point, I always like to say I learned eating disorders backwards because I didn't have guidance on counseling and how to support someone and work with them with where they were at. And so my I then went to my very first training in Santa Barbara that Francie White, who's now a retired registered dietitian, would have. And she would have as guest speakers, Carolyn Costin and Anita Johnson. And that was my first exposure on counseling and how to work with someone and right. and as a clinician they would basically go through all of your own issues and that and that was that was how I became interested right it's interesting because you know like it's sitting here you know as as a psychiatrist and I do some of the medical management but when it's complicated I, I'm referring to the medical physicians you have a therapist here with Lucas and you're the nutritionist it's almost like we have our own type of a mini team and and how we approach eating disorders and I, i'm wondering if you can explain like how do you see your role in this collaborative process like i i always think the nutritionist is you're kind of in the middle of it you know and i, I always feel the nutritionist is not just dispensing nutritional advice and guidance but you actually have to play that role of a beh the behaviorist and sometimes I'm telling my patients whenever I'm referring to a nutritionist is the nutritionist seems sometimes is the least likely liked person on the treatment team because you're the one who's telling Ed you have to do this and Ed is saying, ah, don't listen to her. And but I'm, I'm, so I'm wondering, like, how have you incorporated your role into the treatment team as a collaborative approach? So the interesting part, Jeff, is I agree with you. Oftentimes the registered dietitian is in the middle of it, but there are times that you can't pick the team and they are providers that right. are not trained in eating disorders. And I feel like I am the captain of the ship. I am leading like this is, you know, and I will be telling the doctor, these are the labs that I need you to have done. And I will be telling, like, I just had a situation with a therapist that this was not her area. And I basically explained to her, you know, how sick her client was and that right. she really needs a team that fully specializes in eating disorders. And she's like, well, that's why I brought you on. I said, well, she's a therapist that specializes in this too. And basically, I think the professional integrity is when something's not in your wheelhouse and scope of practice, you ask like, well, who would you recommend? You refer out versus hanging on to this. And, I, and I've been in situations where it's been detrimental and others where the clinicians like Robin, who is the adolescent or who is the adult psychologist or therapist that you refer to? And in this case, I'm glad like the family realized like, this therapist was not the right person. And 
when I referred them to the eating disorder physician and I let the physician know, she was very outspoken saying like, you need an eating disorder therapist. Let me give you some names. And I already knew. So, I mean, that's like the best case scenario, but oftentimes I'm a part of teams that are problematic. And I know when clients have a history of attachment and they're really connected to the clinician, it's like, you can go back to that person. And I think, especially when it comes from the therapist, but I find myself not just helping a person improve their relationship with food and their body and being able to convey to the therapist what I'm working on, but also there's not many, and you probably know this, Jeff, there's not many physicians that specialize in eating disorders. (laughs) Excuse me. And yeah, for the, especially the physicians, sometimes they're the hardest ones to find, you know. Yes. So I am, and, and the handful that there are, they are so backed up because they're the ones we all refer to, but I am guiding the internist or pediatrician, and they act like, yes, I know, but they don't know. And right. they're like, oh, the labs are fine. But as you know, it takes time for the labs to not appear fine, but their vitals be off too. And then when clients will say like, oh, well, the doctor said everything's fine. And then when I'm seeing them in person, as I've started to see some people now, it's such a different scenario. So I feel like I can wear the hat of the mental health care provider, the doctor, but I'm not these people. It's like, I am me, but I've had such wonderful, you know, mentors in my life. And so much of my medical outside of Cedar sinai has been very advantageous for me to have in my career, but also, you know, yeah. going to Ed Tyson's and having him mentor me for years, many years. It's like all of this has helped shape who I am as a right. person and that I can step in where I need to. And I, and, and I was uh, discussing earlier uh, when we were going through some of the research uh, studies uh, and, and reading your book and everything, you know, it, you, you do offer some great insight. Uh, Lucas and I were talking uh, about how, you know, sometimes you're, you can interpret lab results, understanding the nature of an eating disorder in a way that a physician or a primary care doctor who doesn't quite understand eating disorders may o- overlook certain aspects of that. And and again, I think that's what's important for people to understand is is... When you work with a specialist with an eating disorder and you're working with uh, a, a registered dietitian who specializes, they hopefully have the type of training that you have, uh, Robin, where, you know, you know when, I, when I even started with eating disorders and I, 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 I had a nutritionist and she's, and I, the, the nutritionist is ordering labs and I'm thinking to myself, why is she ordering labs, you know? Uh, but it's interesting because like when I look at how, how you look at, interpret, and incorporate it um, as a nutritionist, you, you, you sometimes have that better understanding with the lab work of what's going on with the patient than many physicians will have. Um, so uh, I, I, I think it's something that people have to understand. That, and, and, and I'm always a big person who keeps saying, find a specialist, find a specialist. And sometimes it's hard to, you know. Yes. Uh, and the labs don't always show everything. Eventually they do, but this is also the reason that the physician will order a bone density, right. an EKG. And you know, when we're doing a blood pressure, like whether I'm you know, doing a supine blood, like I'm doing the standing, the lying, the cap, all these factors, because I think that shows more immediate where you're at physically right. and and sometimes doctors don't think twice when a client's saying well my hair is falling out and thinning right. or yes i'm having sleep problems i mean i love this with the sleep and they're talking about oh yes now i was put on this medication for us and it's like well when your nutrition improves and you're ingesting right. more food won't need the medication. So I think like similar to you, Jeff, like there's, it's hard to find psychiatrists. Like we have a few here that specialize in it, but unfortunately there's times where they're over medicated 
for areas that they don't need to be. Right, and, right. you know, being able to have vitamin F, which is right. food, to be able to resolve it. Yeah, we use that term too. I know, you, yes, Luke, I know. Luke had a question here about... Oh, yeah. Why don't you ask it? <laughs> uh, I, I don't buy it. You can ask. We're, we're in the we're in the dilemma here at times, right? Like you mentioned, sometimes we we end up in situations where a, a patient has a treatment team and providers who aren't specialists. Sometimes because there's no one available in the the area who specializes. Sometimes because they have that long term relationship, um, and it how. When you're, when, how do you handle when you're working with a patient, let's say, they say, but I love my therapist, and you're thinking, yeah, but they need a specialist therapist. <laughs> like, how do you handle that situation yourself of both how do you communicate that and how do you help a patient understand that? So an example I always like to give is if, God forbid, you, know, you were diagnosed with cancer, would you go to your primary care physician or would you go to a specialist? Like, of course, Robin, right. I would go to an oncologist. It's like, well, it's the same thing with an eating disorder. You want someone that lives and breathes this. I mean, I have this come up all the time. I see a lot of people that have diabetes and their internist is prescribing them various oral agents. I have someone I'm seeing now and he's on the max dose of four different oral agents. Right. And he has had one consultation with this endocrinologist. And I said, oh, do, so do you see you know, Dr. So-and-so regularly? And he's like, no, my internist is managing everything. Well, it's like, cause he's seeing me cause he wants to avoid insulin now cause he's on the max. Right. And I think it's sort of like <clears throat> having, you know, saying, okay, I have a tennis court in my backyard and I really want to improve my tennis game. So I'm going to read the tennis magazines versus getting out there and trying to work on my forehand. It's sort of like people have at, you know, research where they I don't want to offend my doctor. I don't want to offend my, like if they're offended, they shouldn't be in the profession that they're in because we're in a service industry to do what's of best interest to help the client. So I always like to go the specialist right. route and also to be able to say, you want someone that lives and breathes this. Like I'll say, you want the therapist or doctor version of me. Right, right. right. So I'm curious, Robin, have you ever seen this from the other side where you've joined a team um, somewhere along the recovery process because they are coming from uh, a different dietitian who didn't necessarily specialize in the treatment of eating disorders? Yes, all the time. And, and and fortunately, when someone can recognize this is a little bit out of my area. Same thing with therapists. Yes, Luke, like they'll say, this isn't up my alley. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, because like I find it's always another lingo. And, and, and that's what I think you do so well with the eating disorder trap. Uh, you know, of course, I, I, when I was reading it, uh, I know you wrote this for patients and loved ones and clinicians. But my first thing was, this really should be like required reading in medical schools. And I, I, I think it, it's a book that should also, I really do think it should be in any programs with psychology, social work, anything in the clinical sciences, because your book is, I think I use that word with you, very concise. Like you really hit the important points in a very, again, user-friendly way. And, uh, and that's why, you know, have, have you been getting good success, getting this out to the clinicians? Yeah, getting... so a couple things. I mean, unfortunately, the book came out when COVID hit. Right. So I had to pivot my plan in a new way. So I've upped my social media presence. But as you say this, Jeff, and I've gotten it um, you know, in a couple of programs. This was actually, I had a professor who's a dietitian reach out to me from one of the Cal State universities here telling me you know she wanted to have a copy to read and if it met all of her right. requirements she teaches to all the exercise physiology students right and so now and she, she liked it so it's a required reading and i've heard that and i i've heard this over and over like 
medical schools there. Yeah, I mean, I would love to. So if you have any things on the medical school front, or I mean, I'm happy to send a copy because where I went, I think it's so important because also it's written in a very easy manner. You don't have to be an expert. And I really wanted it to be um, digestible. And yes, right. there's terms that maybe someone won't be familiar with, but just the narrative, the language and how it's composed. So yes, I've knock on wood, it's you know been going well so far. And I feel like when it's safe to have gatherings and tours, I will definitely be be pursuing that again. So to me, I view Good. this as like the pre-party before the party. Good. Now, the other thing now, so that we talked about the clinicians here. One of the most difficult things, I think, when, when, when a, a patient with more of a newer onset eating disorder, but chronically as well, comes in and, and, and you know, they're often family, uh, an eating disorder can be a family disorder as well. Um, again, I think the eating disorder trap kind of, if, if someone reads this and pays attention to it, it helps the parent and maybe even the patient become a specialist because that's the whole thing. That's why we're doing, you know, translating Ed with the research is I'm a very big proponent of you have to have an understanding. You know, if you want to create change and you have that understanding of what's driving it, what's behind it, what it is, that gives you power to create that change. So uh, again, I, I'm with, with families and everything. I find that it's it's a book that helps make the family a specialist. I like. I, I often tell my patients, if you read this book, you will be in the top one percent of knowledge of people who understand eating disorders. Definitely ahead of many providers. Yeah, for even sure, even yeah, the providers the patient too. Patient has to be their own advocate. Yeah. So. How, how do you use this book in your practice? Well, now, when I, since I've been seeing like one to three people a day, when I'm having clients saying, well, I really want to understand this better. I'd like my family to know what's going on in my head. I like take one out. Here is one for you. Here is one for your parents. Right. Because having knowledge and data is powerful, whether they choose to use it or not, it's a different story, but there's, so much information on the computer, books, and and we want to have resources that don't feed into diet culture. Right. That approach from a weight normative place. So, like the other thing I've done in this book is, you know, I want it. If I, I had decided if I was ever going to write a book, I wanted to do something that can just encompass various areas happening now. And what I mean by that is using gender neutral pronouns, like. Right. That's, I think, very hard to find in our field, too, books that encompass that more and more are coming out, but also to be able to have illustrations. Like, I always liked cartoons, and my brother collected comic books when he was a kid, so I thought, well, sometimes people won't understand the terminology or what it's about, but if there's a catchy photo that's non-biased, then it, like, introduces the subject in a light manner before I hit it with like what we're going to talk about. Okay, good. So Robin, I actually have a question. Um, as an outpatient therapist uh, who, you know, I'll, I'll typically see people who are wanting to explore this issue for the first time. So what would your advice be to me to give to my clients as far as choosing their dietitian if they're looking for somebody uh, who specializes in eating disorders? I would ask the dietitian if they work from a health at every size perspective that's one question mm -hmm. and if the dietitian asks like what is health at every size that's not <laughs> obviously that's, that's a red person flag to choose yeah yes also um to tell them you know that they're interested in getting to a place where they can relearn how to become an intuitive eater are they an intuitive eating counselor? Are they trained in intuitive eating? Do they understand what that means? Because I think there's so many what I would call traditional dietitians, which gives being a registered dietitian a bad rap. People associate seeing someone like me as someone who's going to put you on a diet, a meal plan, say don't eat these foods, do eat these foods, and 
be basically be a human calculator, which makes their relationship with food and their body mm. more problematic. Right. So to be able to ask that dietitian, what is their perspective? How do they approach clients? And when they're hearing like, oh, this dietitian is selling me these products or they're telling me to be keto or this, that is another, those are red flags right. too. And also to ask like, have they worked in an eating disorder treatment center? What has been their experience with that? And there's some that will say, well, I've personally had one. I've never worked a treatment center. Make sure your lived experience is super important, but what have you done to enhance your training in it? Do you go to national conferences such as AED, the Academy of Eating Disorders, exactly. IADEP? How, how do you further your knowledge to become seen as an expert in the eating disorder field? Yeah, I tell people the same thing, you know, when you go in and whether it's a therapist or a psychiatrist or anyone who claims to be a specialist, like uh, anyone can claim, you know, and, right. and, but yeah, you want to ask them, do they have memberships? And like you said, the, the, the major eating disorder association, the IADEP, the Academy of Eating Disorders, those especially, you know. But not even um, membership stuff like people can be members it's like being a member of right. a country club and not going exactly <laughs> i pay my dues but like how do you continue to further your skill set and right. enhance your knowledge do you get supervision that's very important right. are you getting supervision by an eating disorder clinician whether it be a mental health care provider or registered dietitian or physician how do you stay on top of what's happening in the eating right. disorder world so Having written this book and everything, how has that changed you, your approach, your life? Like, how has it changed my approach, my life? Well, my approach has always been having a team. And I think having yeah. the book you now just enhances my credibility of what I'm saying. Okay, and good. Yeah. Doing my life well, you're saying so since I didn't have my tour I actually created a podcast which you'll be a right. guest on and I had never planned on a podcast but I think having resources for people because there's so many toxic resources I'm glad to be able to have a resource for all that could just cover a snippet of a topic so that's been um, you know, I've thought about like an online course or a workbook, but I think I'm so busy with clients <laughs> now. It's like, I'm just trying to stay above water because uh, this has been, I would call an ultra marathon. I thought like, oh, when the book comes out and the tour, I'll be able to slow down. Then the pandemic hit and it's, so it's been like a roller coaster that I've not even been able to take a break from that it's been ongoing. So I think the book has just enhanced my credibility when I'm doing I've had people contact me because they either have listened to my podcast or they've read my book so slowly so I feel like the word is getting out and it's just to me all positive you use the term en enhanced your credibility I look at it as it lets somebody peek into the mind of somebody like yourself and how you think and how you approach it and that's what's important I, I do think too. It's 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 not that every clinician uh, or every uh, registered dietitian has this knowledge. There has to be that passion. Which, I, in fact, I th I, I think the first time I met you was in New York. Was it not at an Academy of Eating Disorder conference? Do you I rem I remember exactly. Yeah, where we were I met having you. dinner. Yeah, you, we yes. sat. Yes. So I've known with Robin Mulaney. for quite a while. Yes. Melanie's dinner. I was on with her yesterday. Oh, and yes, so good. Like, yeah, we and 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 then you know Robin of course is on the West Coast. I'm on the East Coast, and through social media, we. So I met your touch. whole team, and yes, and maybe Lucas. I don't know if he's a part of your team. Had met him, but yes, I've still wanted to come to your office, but yes, it was the millennium. We've stayed in touch ever since. Yeah, that was a while ago. Lucas was 
still in the uh, educational phase of all of this, but uh, hopefully you'll get to meet Lucas one day too. Because yes. he he's been. How old were you when you started working again with uh, eating disorder patients? I, um, I mean, you could go back as with patients or just in the field. Uh, in the program. In the program. Uh, I want to say around the age of 19, I started yeah. doing biofeedback therapy for ED-180. Oh. So that, that that's the thing, too. It's like, Great. you know, understanding how that eating disorder mind works is, I think, what makes us eating disorder clinicians a little bit separate from, you know, the therapist who doesn't specialize, the nutritionist who doesn't specialize, et cetera. Um, what have you found most interesting about the mind of people with eating disorders? I was waiting for you to ask that. Mm -hmm. That they can't retain a thought they're discussing. They're having a hard time making decisions, very indecisive. They have high anxiety. There's the paranoia. People are watching what I'm eating, what I'm not eating, how my body's changed. It's like this constant paranoia and also like, what are people going to think if my body, I mean, they're so fixated on their physical appearance, the food choice, what are people going to think of them? Um, And also the mind where like they could physically be in front of me, but I would say more times than none, the eating disorder is sitting in front of me. It's not the soul self. It's not the healthy self, the right. recovered self. Good, good, yeah. And I, I always say I, I find for the most part uh, the, those who have an eating disorder uh, are, are some of the most empathic individuals, you know. And like I always say, I, I'll always say the typical eating disorder, uh, disorder individual is one who has a friend and she knows that her friend's you know favorite cartoon is the peanuts and in April the friend says how she always wishes she had this and then when her December when her birthday's in December her you know the eating disorder patient remembers they get that gift that they thought of in April they wrap it in the Snoopy paper and then and, and then most of the people in the world <laughs> your birthday runs around and it's like oh yeah happy birthday here's a Facebook post you know <laughs> Uh, so it's it's that combination of this terrible ed pathways in the brain kind of ripping apart this you know really amazing potential and power and 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 and, and, and sweetness with so many of these patients and I think that's another component of why when people like yourself myself Lucas uh, are treating or why do we even go into this it's uh, there, there there's a there's a deeper reason you know. <laughs> It's it's like you know really wanting to make a difference, and I and ever since I met you, I I, I picked up on that. So, uh, having been having been the first guest that we've had on our podcast, I, I I really appreciate you you know being willing to come on and and, and share your book with us and everybody uh, who will out uh, who will be out there and see this. Um, is there anything you can think of that you want any listeners to take away? from this the thing I always like to say is it's never too late Mm -hmm. to make a change it doesn't matter if you're in your 70s or you're in your teens or you're in your 40s getting help and support is a way to address this and the ideal is of course early treatment and intervention but it doesn't matter how deep you are and how many years you've been engaging in self-destructive behaviors that there are so many wonderful providers that can help and support you and that we don't want to give up. We want to keep at it. Anything worth achieving requires hard work and consistency and having an eating disorder is like, going to the beach, the waves, wow. sometimes it's like, oh, it's smooth and fun. Wow, this is great. Other times it's like, wow, there's big waves. It's like up and down. I mean, recovery is not linear. Right. And knowing that and buckling up and being ready for the journey and 
to say it's it's common to be burned out and tired of this, but you get to a point that you're sick and tired of feeling poorly to say, I want something more and fulfilling in my life. Because right. when a person has eating disorder, they live in such a very narrow, small world. Well, Robin, uh, thank you for being a guest and thank you for all you do. Thank you for the book. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to sit down in the future more with each other, especially as we get through this pandemic. Um, you know, anytime you're in New York, you're, you're welcome to actually come by the studio again. Okay. Um, and, uh, I, uh, look forward to hearing more from you. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. Right. Now Thank your you. podcast, by the way, just to mention it, it is the podcast is called. My podcast is called the eating disorder trap podcast. Okay. It's great. on iTunes, Spotify, anywhere you can download podcasts and yeah, July yeah. will be a year that it's running every week. Wow. There fantastic. is a new episode. Great. And a lot of great guests on that. So, Thank okay. You. Again, thank you, Robin. Uh, I'll let you. you get back to hopefully your sunny California, and uh, I'll talk with you soon.